All right, so now that we've been talking a lot about networking, let's now focus on what's really necessary in order to turn a monolithic service into a microservice. So instead of having all the code residing in one place, we're now splitting it up into different services and we're gonna introduce network communication in order to talk between them. What I show on this slide is what you would typically have today. In your monolithic service, somewhere in the code, you're gonna call some method. And then you're gonna pass in some arguments and this method is going to return some result back out. Right? Pretend this is whatever programming language you want it to be. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this method call into a network call. And a lot of times people think, well, that's all we got to do is turn the method call into a network call. There's a lot behind that, and it turns out to not be as simple as a lot of people think. So let's go and really look at this in depth. Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to turn this method really into a web service now. And remember, you want your web services to be in different programming languages, potentially. right? We want to maybe use Node on the client and .NET or Java on the server. So now you're going to talk over a network protocol. So now you need to define an explicit language agnostic, that is programming language agnostic, multi-version API contract now. And I think you should be very explicit about that. This is a formal contract that you are writing, and it's going to last you years and years and years into the future because different services version over time. So you really want to spend a lot of time on this and really think it through and come up with a good contract. And I'll say more about these contracts as we continue this talk. When you go and make a contract like this, it's going to be over the network, you're going to lose certain language features, depending on which language you're using. Uh, and so you tend to use, lose things like IntelliSense support. You tend to lose things like refactoring, right? If I rename this method and I want to rename all calls to this method, you can't do that easily anymore, right? And a big thing that you lose is compile time type safety. I'm a huge fan of compile time type safety. I like it when the compiler tells me something's wrong rather than me finding out that something's wrong at runtime, especially if runtime in production. So you're going to lose a lot of compile time safety. Now you can get some of this back by creating client libraries, but that's additional work that has to be done and you have to keep the client libraries that are for a specific programming language in sync with your network API contract. All right, but let's look at this in a little bit more detail still. So not only do you have to have this formal contract now, but these arguments that you used to pass into this method, these arguments now have to be serialized and then sent over the wire to be sent to some server. And that serialization requires a few things. First, it means that the data types that you're using here, they have to be serializable data types. So now what data types you can pass here is a severe subset of what was possible before. And you have to uh, serialize these into some standard format that's actually part of your contract. And there's many serialization technologies out there, like Avro, Thrift, Protocol Buffers, Bond, um, and JSON, XML, or other examples of this. Uh, so serialization it requires the allocation of memory, and it requires walking over the objects to serialize them. Sometimes the objects' data types themselves have to be defined as being serializable. This is all can be very expensive in terms of memory and time. Furthermore, the result also has to be serializable too. So you're going to, the arguments you'll serialize on the client, you'll send them to the server where you will deserialize them. And remember, possibly in different programming languages. So I might serialize into JSON and then on the server side, deserialize the JSON text that's coming in into a .NET or Java object. Uh, and then on the server side, I'm going to send a result back. That'll have to be serialized into JSON or XML or something. And then the client is going to have to deserialize that into some result, which also has to be a serializable data type. So it's a restricted subset of types. And again, all this serialization and deserialization allocates a lot of memory, requires a lot of CPU utilization. In fact, we have seen certain customers where when they profile their service, the profiler is indicating that 90 some percent of the time the service is spending in the serialization and deserialization code. 
So this serialization, deserialization can be a very expensive operation and can really hurt performance of your service quite dramatically. Especially if you use serialization technologies that use things like reflection. Right? Reflection is done at runtime, which can hurt performance. Uh, reflection is offered by things like .NET and uh, Java. Um, if you hand do your serialization instead, and you write specific code for it, then the performance could be greatly improved by doing that. Okay. But let's look at some other differences here. Let's compare and contrast an in-process method call to an out-of-process network request. Well, I've already been talking a good bit about the performance difference there. The network request is going to have much worse performance than the in-process method call. And you're going to be increasing network congestion, which now introduces a lot of unpredictability into the time it's going to take to make the call. So you have to be worried about unpredictable timing. A lot of times when people call a method and it's in the same process, they know that method's going to return you know, within you know, microseconds. But when you make a network request, that can be orders of magnitude longer easily. And in fact, the server may never reply at all. Maybe it has a bug in it, in which case you will just be hung. Um, network requests are unreliable. They're going to re require retry operations now, right? You would almost never put a retry loop around this call to method here if it was in the same process, right? Or put that method call in a retry loop if it's in the same process. But if you make that a network request now, you almost definitely, I mean definitely, want to put this inside some kind of retry loop. Also, you might want to have some timeouts on it. There might be a place where if the server doesn't reply in, let's say, one second, you might just want to give up and move on. So now you want to introduce timeout into this infrastructure that you didn't have or think about before when it was a method call. There's also this thing called a circuit breaker, which is a very useful pattern to take advantage of. Um, it's used typically to prevent denial of service tax from your own clients. So imagine that your service is uh, having a problem, and you have a lot of clients that are hitting that service. Well, those clients, they will retry to hit the server over and over and over again, but the server is really in trouble, and it's not going to all of a sudden start working. This circuit breaker pattern allows clients to try hitting a server so many times, and if within, let's say, one second there have been five failures, the clients just stop. And they say, look, I'm assuming failure on the server. I won't even try to hit the server anymore. This stops the server from being bombarded with a lot of network requests and having to deal with that so effectively you are not causing a denial of service attack on your own service. Uh, and then circuit breakers, if they wait, let's say, a minute without making a request to the server because they've been assuming failure, they will then try again to make a request to the server in hopes that a minute has gone by and the server has fixed itself. But if the server fails again, they will immediately shut that down and then wait another minute before making other requests. But if the server comes back online, then the circuit breaker uh, closes and allows traffic to go through. So I would highly encourage you to read more about circuit breakers. There's a lot on the internet about them. It's a very useful pattern. You should definitely be aware of it, and you should definitely be incorporating it into the client side of your services. Now, because the services, the client side, is going to retry, this requires that the server code has to be idempotent because the server might get the same request multiple times, but you really only want to perform the operation once. So there has to be some additional logic on the server side in order to say, hey, I've already done this once, I don't need to do it again. Um, this is item potency, I'll talk more about it a little bit later on, but the way that you implement it is unfortunately domain specific. So I can't give you like a solid guideline, here's how to always do it. In some cases, it turns out to be very easy to do. In some cases, it turns out to be quite difficult to do. Um, but as I said, I will talk about that more a little bit later on in this course. Well, because you're turning the method call into a network call, you're now going to have some security ramifications, potentially. So the server could now be receiving requests from anybody, whereas before this method could only be called by code in the same process. So now you have a service sitting on your cluster, anybody could call it, so now you might want to introduce authentication to make sure it's being called only by entities that are allowed to call it. You might want to do some authorization there. You might want to encrypt traffic that goes over the wire, whereas you would probably never even think about encrypting these arguments or return values if it was just being passed around within the same process. 
Um, this security is more typically required in a virtual network for compliance reasons. So sometimes, just to meet compliance reasons, you need to turn encryption on or authentication on. Uh, and sometimes if you're running third-party code that you may not trust within the same cluster, you may need to turn this on. And then the last thing I have here is related to diagnostics. Um, you're going to have networking issues now that you didn't have before. So what if something goes wrong with the network? You're going to have performance counters, event entries, logging that happens now, causality stocks, uh, causality information, call stacks. Where the call stack now crosses over a network wire. The client makes a network call and then the server continues execution. Um, how do you track all of that? How do you know when something fails? You know, what caused that whole flow to go from service to service? And if you're writing event logs for, with this diagnostic information, which is an, a really great thing to do, you should definitely be doing it, and then you should look at these logs later when failures occur, be aware that on different servers, the clocks are not completely synchronized. Uh, first of all, within a cluster, all the clocks should be on UTC time. You want to use universal coordinated time zone for all the machines. But even when you do that, some machines are going to speed up, some might slow down. The clocks are not completely in sync. And so on one machine, the client, it might be 1 a.m. in the morning, you send a request and you log something there that you're sending a request to a server. The server might think it's 12.58 um, earlier, two minutes earlier, and then it's going to log that the incoming request came in. Well, if you try to look at those logs holistically, the server will effectively re be reporting that the request came in two minutes before the client sent the request. So you have to be aware that this is a real thing that could happen, and you have to account for this, what we call clock skew, on these different servers when analyzing these log requests. So the point I'm trying to make with all of this is that it's not as simple as turning a method call into a network call. There's a, there's a lot of good reasons to do this, but it does introduce a lot of complexity. And what are the reasons to do this? That, those reasons are the ones I spoke about earlier in this course. Right? There are really four reasons to split a monolith into microservices. That scale independently, that different technology stacks, the two or more clients, and the conflicting dependencies. So you want to be really wanting to have one or more of these features in order to consider breaking things up so that a method call becomes a network call. Right? That's the trade-offs. Okay? And hopefully that gives you a good sense of the networking and when to take advantage of it and the pain points that you'll have with it.